Wow. So much gun talk right now. I had no idea the topic of guns would be so topical when I picked this topic to suck into a month or so back. Toughest topic I've tackled so far, easily. Marches going on across the country to ban assault rifles, school walkouts, gun rights advocates staging their own protests, celebrities posting all kinds of feel-good, mostly meaningless, honestly, emotional quotes. But how many of these celebrities, high school kids, protesters, gun rights activists, actually know what they're yelling about? After all the research I poured over the past few weeks, I gotta say, sadly, not many. And I feel like the media has done a really, really shitty job of tackling this issue. This shit is so much more complex than getting rid of a a gun or a class of guns. It's much deeper than that. So let's go deep, time suckers. I know you can do it. Let's deep dive into America's history with firearms and explore what the real problem is with mass murder in this country today on Time Suck. You're listening to Time Suck. Hello, listener. Hello, Time Sucker. Hello, fun, curious human meat sack. I'm Dan Cummins, and this is Time Suck. And Time Suck is brought to you today by Breach. Breach is a new kick-ass podcast brought to you by Midroll. A podcast team started looking into the biggest hack in history and ended up in the middle of their own story. A mysterious voicemail, disappearing files. It got personal. Breach is a new podcast that takes you inside the world's biggest hacks. They set out to answer questions about the hack of a huge American company and found themselves investigating a Russian conspiracy. So subscribe to Breach, B-R-E-A-C-H, in your podcast app right now. Episode 1 drops today, March 26th. I listened to the trailer. Man, very well produced. Very interesting. Uh, yeah, this, is a, this looks to be a very kick-ass podcast. So check it out. And all right, time suckers. A couple quick things. And then we're getting into today's episode, right? Had a blast in Cleveland. Holy shit. Saturday shows were sold out. The Thursday and Friday shows were, were fantastic as well. So many time suckers at every one. Got some more amazing stuff for the suck dungeon, uh, including a super cool shot glass crafted with a sculpture of my crazy face. It's amazing. Got some cocker spaniel blood to appease Nimrod. Hail Nimrod. Of course, it's not real blood. I had to ask. Uh, it's, uh, some crazy Hungarian sauce, but, uh, made to look like blood <laughs> and, uh, so many teachers in the crowd, man, you guys are making these shows the most fun of my entire career. Can't thank you enough. Uh, one audience member, uh, did not have fun on Saturday. A time suck fan, uh, who is also a flat earth believer, uh, got pissed at my new flat earth material. It's the flat earth tour and, uh, and left the show. Sorry, brother. I, I can't go there. I can't pretend your belief in a flat earth has any basis in anything other than wackadoodle madness. We can agree on plenty of other shit, so I hope you still enjoy the show. I hate when people think they can only be friends or like people who just have to agree with them on everything. It's fucking ridiculous. It's important to, uh, you know, to have, I have plenty of friends in my life who, in certain ways, I think they're fucking insane. But, you know, and, and I'm sure, I'm sure they think so about me as well. Positive. Uh, thanks again for all the recent iTunes reviews. I um, mean, you guys are so good, man. Hail Nimrod. Hail, hail Lucifina. Why not? Hail Bojangles. Triple M. Chickatillo. Oh, this whole thing is fun. Uh, and the reviews have been fantastic. My, my favorite recent one is from Prima, Airy Peak. It's so funny to me. They wrote in, uh, they wrote saying, listening to Time Suck with Dan Cummins is like walking into a slightly grungy bar and finding a crowd gathered around a very loud man, gesticulating wildly and occasionally leaping into the air and spinning around. Drawn like a rubbernecker to a wreck, you join the outer periphery so you can get a better look. He's compelling and revolting, brilliant and idiotic. <laughs> but ultimately informative and entertaining. Next thing you know, you're in the front row buying around for the house. That'll do, Dan Cummins. That'll do. Wow. Prima Airy Peak. Man, are you a writer? That was some delightful word wizardry you just threw down. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. Now come see me. Week after next, I start a big old comedy run. Big old Flat Earth Tour continues. Let's see how many more, how many more people I can piss off. I'll be, <laughs> I'll be at Charlotte, North Carolina on April 8th. That one is packing out, man. Atlanta on, ni- on the 9th. Birmingham on the 10th, Huntsville, Alabama, come out, uh, come on out, NASA. Let's talk about the Flat Earth on the 11th. Nashville, Tennessee on the 12th, Houston, Texas, 13th, Dallas, Texas, the 14th, San Antonio, Texas on the 15th, then Salt Lake City, Utah, one of the very first towns I ever started getting invited back to. The city I recorded, Don't Wake the Baron, on the 20th and 21st of April. Links in the episode description to the venues. The Flat Earth tour continues. San Francisco, Sacramento, Phoenix coming up right, out, right afterwards in May. Another Lifetime Suck podcast in Spokane on May 6th. Only one I'll be doing until Orlando late in the summer. So get there. 
It's going to be so much sucking fucking fun. More tour dates, dancummins.tv and Space Lizards. I made contact with David Icke's psychic the other day and paid for the deluxe reading. Oh, it's happening. 33 business days. <laughs> Max. It's going to be glorious. Uh, and last thank you. Thanks to the Time Suckers. Going to timesuckpodcast.com. Click on the, that Amazon button to take you to amazon.com to do your shopping and help Time Suck while you do so. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now let's get into guns. All right. It made sense to me to start off today by revisiting the Second Amendment because that's where this all began. So let's do that now. On September 25th, 1789, the first Congress of the United States proposed 12 amendments to the Constitution. The 1789 Joint Resolution of Congress proposing the amendments is on display in the Rotunda in the National Archives Museum in Washington, D.C. if you want to check it out. Ten of the proposed 12 amendments were ratified by three-fourths of the state legislatures. On December 15th, 1791, the Second Amendment is the one we're talking about today and like most of the others, surprisingly brief. Only 27 words. It says, in its entirety, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And holy shit is the nation divided right now over how much arms we should be able to bear today or if we should even be able to bear them at all. Here are a few other uh, amendments just for a little historical context. We got the First Amendment, my favorite as a comic, saying uh, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peacefully to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Free speech, motherfuckers. Free speech. Make my living off it. Couldn't do this podcast without it. Not even, not even close. Then there's the Fourth Amendment, uh, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Yeah, no legal search and seizure. You don't just get to waltz in and take my shit, Uncle Sam. Where's your warrant, you dick? Show me the papers. This isn't 1930s Germany. This isn't most of the 20th century in Russia. Don't tread on me, motherfucker. And then there's the Ninth Amendment. Congress shall not dictate personal incivilities regardless of the establishment or abolishment of henceforth decreed prior ordinances that decode or decipher a variety of fraudulent or spurious reports of either a beneficial or detrimental nature. Moreover, Prospective claims to the contrary can include non-erroneous but otherwise misleading controversy shall forfeit all previous conditions. And if you're not familiar with that amendment, that's because I just made that shit up. How confusing was that? <laughs> How confused were you getting with that old-timey lingo? That was a joy to write. That one was so much fun for me. So much fun to think about. So many of you trying so hard to follow the insane logic of the utter nonsense I just word vomited into your ear holes. No, the Ninth Amendment says the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. So basically, the Founding Fathers said, we know these rights can't possibly cover everything going forward. New shit's going to come up. And you fuckers are going to have to figure that out for yourselves. But back to the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms. Why was that right considered so important it ranked right behind freedom? Well, because sometimes you actually have to fight for freedom. And when that's happened, historically, uh, guns, you know, have come in pr pretty handy. Uh, Founding Father James Madison originally proposed the Second Amendment shortly after the Constitution was officially ratified as a way to provide more power to state militias, which today are considered the National Guard. Uh, it was deemed a compromise between Federalists, those who supported the Constitution as it was ratified, and the Anti-Federalists, those who supported states having more power. Having just used guns and other arms to ward off the British, the amendment was originally created to give citizens the opportunity to fight back against a tyrannical federal government. Freedom doesn't always come cheap. And the founding fathers knew that all too well. Some of them had just been shot at. Some of them had shot others in the war. Since its ratification, Americans have been arguing over the amendment's meaning and interpretation. One side interprets the amendment to mean it provides for collective rights, while the opposing view is that it provides individual rights. Those who take the collective side think the amendment gives each state the right to maintain and train formal formal militia units that can provide protection against an oppressive federal government. They argue the well-regulated militia clause uh, clearly means the right to bear arms should only be given to those organized groups. 
Now, they believe this allows for only those in official militia to carry guns legally and say the federal government cannot abolish state militias. Those with the opposite viewpoint, which seem to be the majority of citizens, or, or at least the majority until the recent rash of, uh, of public sh- shootings and protests, believe the amendment gives every citizen the right to own guns, free of federal regulations, to protect themselves in the face of danger. The individualists believe the amendment's militia clause was never meant to restrict each citizen's right to bear arms. Those supporting an, an individual's right to own a gun, such as the National Rifle Association, argue the Second Amendment should give all citizens, not just members of a militia, the right to own a gun. Those supporting stricter gun control, like the Brady campaign, believe the Second Amendment is not a blank check for anyone to own a gun. They feel that restrictions on fire, firearms, such as who can have them, under what conditions, where they can be taken, and what types of firearms are available, are necessary. Now, quick note on the Brady Bill, because it's pretty, historic, uh, pretty historically important as far as U.S. gun control is concerned. During a White House ceremony attended by James S. Brady on November 30th, 1993, President Bill Clinton signed the Brady handgun control bill into law. The law requires a prospective or required a prospective handgun buyer to wait five business days while the authorities check his or her background, during which time the sale is approved or prohibited based on established set of criteria. 1981, James Brady, who served as press secretary for President Reagan, was shot in the head by John Hinckley Jr., during an attempt on President Reagan's life outside a hotel in D.C. Reagan himself was shot in his left lung, but recovered and returned to the White House within two weeks, which is pretty fucking impressive. You know, he was not a young man when he was in the White House. Old man takes a shot to the lung. Two weeks later, he's like, nah, let's go sign some more papers. Brady, the most seriously injured in the attack, was momentarily pronounced dead at the hospital, but survived and, and began an impressive recovery from his debilitating brain injury. Uh, During the 1980s, Brady became a leading proponent of gun control legislation. In 1987, succeeded in getting a bill introduced into Congress. The Brady Bill, as it became known, was staunchly opposed by many congressmen who, in reference to the Second Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, questioned the constitutionality of regulating the ownership of arms. In 1993, with the support of President Clinton, an advocate of gun control, the Brady Bill became a law. Well, uh, over 100 million background checks have been conducted since that law took effect. And then in 1994, Clinton signed the law, uh, the Public Safety and Recreational Firearms Use Protection Act. It's a very wordy title. uh, Placed restrictions on the number of military features a semi-automatic gun could have and banning large capacity magazines for consumer use. Under the assault weapons ban in 1994, the definition of semi-automatic assault weapon included specific semi-automatic firearm models by name, other semi-automatic firearms that possess two or more from a certain set of features. Semiotic rifles, or semi-automatic rifles, excuse me, able to accept detachable magazines and two or more of the following would be banned. Folding or telescoping stock, pistol grip, bayonet mount. Who the fuck is having a bayonet mount? Flash suppressor, a device attached to the muzzle of a rifle that reduces its visible signature while firing by cooling or dispersing the burning gases that exit the muzzle. Phenomenon typical of uh, carbine length uh, weapons. Primary intent is to reduce the chances that the shooter will be blinded in low light shooting conditions. Contrary to pro- popular belief, it's it's only uh, a minary, minor, excuse me, secondary benefit if the flash suppressor reduces the intensity of the flash visible to the enemy. Uh, gr- grenade launcher was also on the list. I gotta say that that seems you know reasonable. Uh, you know, <laughs> banning a semi-automatic, semi-automatic rifle uh, that somebody wants to attach a bayonet and a fucking grenade launcher to. Jesus Christ! I mean, look, I get it. Sounds fun. I mean, yeah, I, I want to shoot one now that, I, now that I talk about it. I would love to shoot a grenade. But wanting to do something, not always a good reason to have it be legal. I also would love to make a time bomb and blow up a building. Not, not one with anybody in it, but I just think it would be fun to blow up a fucking building. I mean, come on. That'd be pretty sweet, especially with a time bomb. You know, you fucking walk away like in a movie, and then maybe like as you're walking away behind you, just, just fucking crumbles, and you did that with your brain power and explosives. Doesn't make it a good idea. <laughs> Doesn't make it something that should ever be done. Uh, yeah, it'd just be exciting. I mean, I spent a few solid months in high school trying to make bombs. I didn't have any enemies I wanted to kill. I just wanted to blow some structures up. I wanted to fucking cause some mayhem. Uh, you know, when I finally watched that movie, uh, oh my God, Fight Club. It spoke, spoke to me way more than it should have. Um, <laughs> and it is a little crazy to me that I could attach a grenade launcher to a semi-automatic military style rifle and have a fucking bayonet on it. Jesus Christ. As, you, as, you'll, as you'll find out soon, living in Idaho, I can pretty much have almost anything. I could have a, a one with a bayonet if I pass the right paperwork checks, which I might not be able to based on being arrested for a DUI and a separate incident of city theft when I was younger. I, I may not be able to actually get these, but potentially uh, I could also have an M16 
if I, if I had the right background. More, more on that later. Uh, the primary topic of conversation and gun debate today is the AR- AR-15. That seems to be the hot, the hot topic. Most states, you can have one. Uh, in some states, you can buy an under-the-barrel grenade launcher right now. I actually found a pretty cool-looking one online for 1500 bucks at gunbroker.com uh, where I could, I could also buy grenades in, uh, in some states. Grenades considered a Title II weapon under the National Firearms Act. Each state gets to determine which Title II weapons, if any, are allowed within its borders. Like Hawaii, for example, no grenades. Uh, Idaho, you can have up to three nuclear warheads per household. I'm fucking kidding. Uh, but in Idaho, no Title II weapons are banned. You can have grenades, uh, which are classified as destructive devices. You can have machine guns, silencers, short-barreled, sh- short-barreled shotguns, short-barreled rifles, all sorts of shit if you pass the right background checks, uh, which makes me nervous about my neighbors a little bit. Uh, what kind of arsenal they could potentially have. The assault weapons ban passed by Clinton expired on September 13th, 2004, was not renewed. More on current gun laws later. Sadly, they're very confusing, and they differ wildly from state to state, which I think is part of the national problem right now. You know, it's very hard to argue about something effectively for or against and have a real discussion about it when when it's almost impossible to determine exactly what the fuck is going on. Uh, Before we move on, let's talk about confirmation bias real quick. Uh, What is confirmation bias? Well, it's the tendency to interpret new evidence as confirmation of one's existing beliefs or theories it's something I fight all the time on this podcast. Sometimes I do a better job, you know, fighting it than others. In the context of the day, example of confirmation bias would be coming into the episode with either a guns are the worst thing ever and the root of all evil and getting rid of them would make everything wonderful and peaceful and everyone would start holding hands and love each other and comb each other's hair and sit in drum circles and be the fucking best, extremely far left angle. Another example of confirmation bias would be coming into this episode with the guns are the only things keeping the government from turning the citizenry into some type of dystopian group of slaves. And without guns, rape and murder rates would explode. People would just be fucking stabbed in the streets every day, and we're all in grave danger. Extremely kind of far right angle. So to avoid either confirmation bias as much as humanly possible, uh, I, I, I really tried to just include stats and data that back up the opinion that, that uh, or sorry, I'm not just going to only include stats and data that back up the opinion I already had before I started my research. And with this topic, you can easily do that. And that's what I see so much of in the media right now. I mean, you can find tons of info that'll make it look like, holy shit, we got to fucking get rid of everything right now. And then you can find also tons of info where you're like, wait a minute, I, I don't know the guns are the problem. I mean, there, there is a lot of info on both sides. And I feel like most people just pick their side and just push that info, which is not fucking helping anything. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, to avoid that, you know, I looked at a ton of varying sources this week. Leaned a lot on uh, boring ass stats, to be honest, uh, from sources like the Department of Justice, other governmental agencies. I know boring stats aren't always the most fun, but they're fucking important. I'm going to try and make it as fun as possible, and we're going to look through uh, a variety of those today. Uh, I looked at articles from pro gun advocacy groups, and also at articles from places like the Atlantic, which on issues like this one promote a like obviously, and I would even say preposterously liberal angle. Uh, With all the public shootings, especially school shootings, this subject is going to be a strongly emotional one for many of you, which I get. I'm well aware of the marches and protests regarding banning assault weapons happening right now. A huge protest march went right by my hotel this past Saturday in Cleveland. I was staying downtown at the Hyatt. Thousands of protesters marched right outside my window on Saturday as I did research for for the suck. Uh, That much more pressure to get this shit right. And because of the emotional nature of this topic, the rawness, I ask you to do your best to push down the emotions this invokes in you. You know, not, not, pun not intended, don't let this trigger you, you know, uh, for the roughly 90 minutes it's going to take convey, to convey today's information. There are too many voices speaking right now in the media from an emotional place. And I, and I just, I understand why that's happening. Coming from a place of grief, that sort of talk doesn't uh, help anyone understand an issue like this. Just going to a place of guns are bad, let's get rid of them. It's, it's childish. That's an overly simplistic thought. And you're going to find out why as we go through this, and we can do better than that. Knowledge is fucking power. Informed decisions are the best decisions. Let's learn as much as we can, make the best ones we can. We're going to take an uh, in-depth look, deep dive, United States gun policy and how the policy affects our culture and our daily lives. I want to give you the most stats possible. Uh, You know, I want to to raise some points you may not have thought of surrounding this issue, and I'm sure you're going to send me some perspectives and some facts on this topic topic in the coming weeks that I hadn't thought of. I'm sure we're going to get a lot of great updates out of this. So let's, um, let's get into a timeline, a baby one today. Uh, to understand uh, our history with guns a lot more and, and, and America's historical relationship with them. Let's, let's go into that timeline right now. Strap on those boots, soldier. 
We're marching down a time suck timeline. Twelve fifty CE. The origin of gunpowder is unknown. Uh, may have not may have occurred first in either China, Turkey, or Europe. Definitely not Poland, because those subhuman savages can barely tie their damn shoes, let alone invent something important. Kidding. I ran into several Polish fans in Cleveland who busted my balls about me constantly busting the balls of Polish people here in the suck. Love teasing my wife's family. Those boisterous, pierogi-eating, beautiful bastards. Now, gunpowder of some form was referenced in writings from the 9th century CE in China. Way before that, the ancient Romans referenced something called Greek fire. It's some type of incendiary weapon used at least as early as 672 CE. Way before that, during the Han Dynasty, a man named Wei Boyang was first to write anything about what probably was gunpowder in China. He wrote about a mixture of three powders that could fly and dance violently. But the first record describing the actual combination of charcoal, sulfur, and saltpeter uh, mixed to produce a rapidly burning or exploding powder is coded in some writing by Franciscan monk Roger Bacon right around 1250 CE. Uh, and then the army of British uh, monarch uh, King Edward III uh, first used a device called a hand cannon in battle in 1364 CE. It's the earliest version of a modern firearm. It, it was a handheld metal chamber with attached metal handle, very simple looking with the wick you lit by hand, and it was just what it sounded like, a tiny single-shot cannon. It was extremely inaccurate, dangerous to use, terrifying for enemies to hear and witness. Its benefit was mostly psychological. Like if you have to get shot at by something and it's not a low-velocity pellet gun, uh, get shot at by a, a 14th-century hand cannon. Unless someone is shooting you from just a few feet away, it's, it's probably not going to hit you. 1424 CE, mechanical device has been invented to fire the small hand cannon. The beginning of modern trigger technologies arrived. 1485 CE, British monarch King Henry VII organized a corps of the yeomen of the guard, and half of them were armed with a new weapon, the harquebus, or uh, also called the arquebus, a handgun with a hook-like projection or lug on its undersurface, useful for steadying it against battlements or objects when firing. It's like a rifle version of the hand cannon when you look at pictures of it. By, 19, by 1485, these weapons had a, had a sort of mechanical trigger, the earliest form of a musket uh, or rifle. These early firearms had a matchlock, a device that connected a smoldering wick to the gunpowder with the pull of a trigger. Sounds time-consuming and terrible. Uh, I feel like after a few shots, if I didn't hit something, I, I would just give up with one of those. And I guess the recoil was a motherfucker on those. Like, it would just knock you down. Uh, by 1630, flintlock guns were a thing. Uh, the flintlock did two things mechanically. It opened the lid of the flash pan and provided an igniting spark without a wick. So the wick is uh, now gone. Black powder enthusiasts still mess around with the flintlock rifles, man. Most states have a special uh, kind of hunting season for people who choose to use a muzzle loader. I remember a guy, this is how rural uh, it was where I grew up. A friend of my grandpa, I only knew him as Buckhorn. Seriously, his name was Lawrence, I think, but he went by Buckhorn. That is so backwoods Idaho. And Buckhorn, of course, was a huge muzzle loader uh, aficionado. He was always talking about muzzle loading. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, muzzle loaders is just a gun you load via the muzzle or barrel used to hunt with, uh, similar to special archery seasons. In, in Idaho, in addition to muzzle loading and archery, there's also a special two week deer season exclusive to crossbow hunters and an annual weekend deer hunt open only to throwing knives. In Idaho County, Idaho, there's a one day sun up to sundown elk hunt open uh, only for the use of throwing stars. And then there's a never-ending fist fight bear season open to anyone who believed all of that bullshit I just talked about after archery. You can't hunt with throwing stars. <laughs> Actually, you probably can. There may not be specific regulation against that. I just, I don't know if that would be illegal. Even if it is illegal, I don't, I don't feel like a, a game warden in their right mind is going to try to stop someone uh, fucking, you know, chasing deer with a ninja star. Especially if they get, especially if it works and they kill one. Because if you do that, you're, you're a fucking, you're a bad motherfucker or crazy or both. Uh, on July 4th, uh, 1777, America declares independence from Great Britain. The Revolutionary War is fought largely with muskets. And those old muskets also sound terrible. They sound like a huge pain in the ass to work with. You would open a cartridge before every sh shot, uh, you know, and it would have a little musket ball and some gunpowder inside. You would have to load the barrel, you know, with a new lead ball for every shot. You'd have to pull the firing hammer back to the half cock position, load the priming pan with gunpowder for every single damn shot, then pour extra powder into the muzzle or barrel, then pour the musket ball in, then stuff the cartridge paper down in order to keep the musket ball from just sliding back out, then push the lead ball as far down into the barrel as possible with a ramrod, then cock the hammer and fire one time and hope that it worked. It often did not. <laughs> then do all of that shit all over again. It was fucking terrible, but it was still a more effective weapon than shooting an arrow or throwing a spear. 
I don't think anyone is really dicking around with muskets today outside of gun historians, uh, you know, people like Buckhorn and, uh, and Revolutionary War reenactors. Uh, Reverend Alexander Forsyth uh, patents the first percussion ignition in 1807, which he developed after a rainy duck hunt in his native Scotland. He grew frustrated with the flintlock's notoriously slow firing time, one that allowed the birds to spot the flame from the pan, change course before the weapon actually discharged, misfires from wet gunpowder. His new lock is faster, uh, keeps the firing powder inside the gun out of the elements. In 1823, Jacob and Samuel Hawken design their uh, eponymous rifle, which becomes the favored muzzleloader for hunting planes game with the barrel 33 to 36 inches long. I bet that son of a bitch was heavy. Uh, the Hawken rifle is shorter than the Frontier Long Rifle, and the 10-pound gun, oh, okay, it's only 10 pounds, uh, is owned by some of the most famous hunters of, of, of you know, the, the era, Teddy Roosevelt, ah, former suck topic right there, Kit Carson, Daniel Boone, better do Daniel Boone one of these days. Uh, that's what my mom calls me to this day, Daniel Boone. In 1836, uh, again, at very small town Idaho, I knew a guy named Buckhorn, and my mom calls me Daniel Boone. In 1836, the first reliable multi-firing handheld firearm hits the market, the Branson Tallawacker. Now, the Branson Tallawacker can fire eight shots in four minutes via its patented push-clip loading mechanism. You could push a five-shot clip of bullets into the internal magazine, but had to use your hip to do so if you were alone. And also, because of a design flaw, you had to point the barrel at yourself to do so. And after Charles Branson shot his dick off uh, with an 1835 prototype, it began to be called the Branson Tallywacker. <laughs> and that is horseshit. No, that would be a horrible gun design. No. Uh, no, in 1836, Connecticut-born gun manufacturer Samuel Colt received a U.S. patent for a revolver mechanism that enabled a gun to be fired multiple times without reloading with a mechanism that automatically rotated over to the next bullet upon firing. Some dude named Elijah Hayden Collier out of Boston had already been messed around with an early flintlock revolver uh, since 1814, but the ones he was making were unreliable they weren't semi-rotating, so you couldn't fire multiple shots quickly. Colt founded a company to manufacture his revolving cylinder pistol. However, sales initially were slow and the business floundered. Then in 1846, with the Mexican War underway, the U.S. government ordered 1,000 Colt revolvers. In 1855, Colt opened what was the world's largest private armament factory in which he employed advanced manufacturing techniques such as interchangeable parts and an organized production line. By 1856, the company could produce 150 weapons per day. Colt was also an effective promoter, and by the start of the U.S. Civil War, he had made the Colt revolver perhaps the world's best-known firearm. The first multi-shot rifle was introduced during the uh, start of the Civil War in 1860, known simply as the Spencer Repeating Rifle. Spencer Repeating Guns were, were designed, uh, they, were, they were technically advanced. They used cartridges, a recent development, and could fire seven shots in 15 seconds. But the Army didn't want, uh, initially, to have a repeating gun, fearing that soldiers would just fire more often, basically waste bullets, and constantly need fresh ammunition and overtax their supply system. But in 16, or 1863, President Lincoln text, uh, test fired a Spencer, and then his approval uh, led to the purchase of 107,372 Spencer repeating carbines, uh, and uh, 144,500 of these ended up being made, and the, and the Spencer became the principal repeating gun of the Civil War. The Gatlin gun was invented in 1862. It looks, looks more like a small cannon than a gun. This thing was not a handheld weapon uh, and still is not unless you're the fucking Punisher. Uh, it was a rapid-fire, spring-loaded, hand-cranked weapon and forerunner of the modern machine gun. The pump-action shotgun came around in 1882. Christopher Spencer, Sylvester Roper developed a pump-action shotgun on which Roper was granted a patent in 1882, which led to the production of their model, 1890 pump-action shotgun, the, Sp the Spencer Pump, was uh, heavy, ill-balanced, and clunky to operate. By 1902, John Browning had developed a reliable, accurate five-shot pump-action semi-automatic shotgun. And by 1909, the shotgun as we know it today, uh, reliable, established in its final form. 1896, Paul uh, Mauser, uh, Mount, oh, shit, uh, you guys are going to fucking probably go after me now. I didn't look up this before the recording. Uh, Mauser, god dang it. He introduced the Mauser uh, C96 broom handle, the first mass-produced and commercially successful semi-automatic pistol, uh, which, which uh, uses the recoil energy of one shot to reload the next. It can fire 10 rounds without the need to reload. Uh, clearly, I haven't been talking about that uh, handgun with anybody uh, for a long time because I, ah, Mauser, I hope that's how I'm saying it, uh, saying it correctly. Anyway, various prototypes were designed in the late 19th century. The first true effective machine gun to be put into widespread production was the M1917 Browning machine gun. Browning, that's a word I feel confident about. I can, I can pronounce Browning all goddamn day long. 
Uh, that was put into production in 1917. It could fire some 450 rounds a minute. 450 rounds a minute, over seven shots a second. I mean, eventually it would overheat, but man, holy shit. That is going to tear whatever it hits to fucking pieces. Now let's talk about the M16. This is the gun I dreamed of running through the woods with as a kid. Some type of Red Dawn, all hell has broken loose scenario. Uh, when I think of machine guns, you know, I uh, I think of the M16. I think I think most people do. The M16 is the one uh, widely used by the U.S. military beginning in 1964. It's a machine gun associated with Vietnam. When, when you see a stencil of a machine gun, odds are it's going to be an M16. You know, if you ask for a tattoo of a machine gun, odds are M16. In 1969, it came standard with a 30-round magazine. It can fire at a rate between 750 and 900 rounds per minute. Total worldwide production of M16s has been approximately 8 million, making it the most produced firearm of its caliber. It's a highly modifiable weapon of war. All current M16-type rifles can mount under-barrel 40-millimeter grenade launchers, such as the M203 and the M320. Both use the same 40-millimeter uh, grenades as the, as the older standalone M79 grenade launcher. The M16 can also mount under-barrel 12-gauge shotguns, so you can have a shotgun on your fucking M16. Uh, can also be modified to have an under-barrel tear gas riot control launcher. It can have a bayonet attached. New M16s also have built-in MP3 players, Bluetooth uh, voice command firing software, internal hand sanitizer dispensers, single drink Keurig coffee dispensers, and a small LCD screen where you can play either Ms. Pac-Man or Centipede. Get the fuck out of here. Of course, I made up everything after Bayonet. Uh, but it does have a lot of crazy stuff. And the M16 is an important weapon to bring up in today's discussion because it relates to the most controversial assault weapon on the market today, the AR-15. The Colt AR-15 is, is a lightweight magazine-fed gas-operated semi-automatic rifle, uh, which the AR stands for Armalite, by the way, not assault rifle. And, uh, and, and it's, it's the semi-automatic version of the M16. And you can, and you can get 5, 10, 20, 30-round magazines, and, and it fires as fast as you can keep pulling that trigger. And technically, not only can, can you buy an, an, R, an AR-15, you can also buy an M16 today, Kind of. It's complicated. And let's hop on out of this timeline to talk about that. Good job, soldier. You made it back. Barely. Okay, so now we've run through a brief and admittedly incomplete overview of the history of firearm development. Uh, you know now, if you didn't before, that a handheld weapon that handheld weaponry, uh, more powerful than a muzzle loader, really hasn't been around that long. Automatic and semi-automatic weapons came around long after the Second Amendment was drawn up, which is part of the cultural debate going on right now, and, and there's no getting around that. The difference in firepower between the days of the Founding Fathers and now is tremendous. There were no semi-automatic or automatic handheld guns back then. There just wasn't. What is the difference between semi-automatic and automatic weapons? Uh, pretty simple. Uh, a semi-automatic weapon fires one shot every time the trigger is pulled. An automatic weapon fires continually until the trigger is released. And this brings us back to the M16 and the AR-15. Uh, I didn't realize until I came across an article in the Washington Examiner that just came out in October of 2017 that technically fully auto uh, M16s are still legal, but very hard to get a hold of. Uh, allow me to explain here. And Again, in May of you know 86, President Reagan signed the Firearm Owners Protection Act, which among other things made the sale of fully automatic firearms manufactured before that year, illegal. Owning the guns are still legal. It, it's just uh, exceptionally difficult and very expensive to get your hands on one. To, to legally own a fully automatic weapon requires three things, money, time, and an absolutely pristine criminal record. Anyone who wants one must first have a lot of money. Uh, when, you know, when Reagan made owning a fully automatic weapon manufactured after 86 illegal, the federal government capped the supply making the guns left in circulation prohibitively, you know, very expensive, the whole supply and demand economics. For instance, uh, while a brand new semi-automatic AR-15 can cost as little as 450 bucks on sale, uh, the fully auto M16 version costs upwards of 20 grand. And by the way, I've been on so many websites where you can buy assault rifles and explosives the past few days that I am positive that if I wasn't already, I am now for sure on some sort of government watch list. So many Google searches of shit like, where can I buy a grenade? How many grenades can I buy? How many AR-15s can I buy? Where can I find an M16? Are grenade launchers still legal in Idaho? I still can't believe that if I wanted to take the time to get the proper level of registration, I could get an AR-15 with an under-the-barrel mounted grenade launcher. Uh, just, <laughs> I could get that ordered right now. Oh, I feel like before I consider getting that, I have to build a panic room slash doomsday prepper bunker. 
Anyway, to get a, uh, an automatic rifle, it has to be a gun that was manufactured before 1986. It must be registered with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms in the National Firearms Registration and Transfer Records Database. There are less than 500,000 full automatic weapons in circulation as opposed to the millions of semi-automatic rifles. Then you got to find a dealer, which is hard. Back in the 1930s, you could order a belt-fed machine gun, like the ones used in the front line of you know front lines of world, First World War, World War One, through the mail. You could just like fucking have that shit Amazon to your house, essentially. Not possible today. Anyone who wants to own a fully automatic weapon must find a dealer who possesses not only a federal firearms license. They have to find a dealer who has gone through additional background checks and who pays increased licensing fees. A class three dealer, someone who's uh, undergone extensive investigation by the ATF. Again, I probably would not make the cut, and, and maybe that's best for everybody. Uh, before buying a fully automatic weapon, a person must pay a $200 tax, register an application with the federal government. That means filing out a 12-page application, submitting fingerprints, sending in photos, current photos to the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. And then there's uh, the whole thing of, you know, have you been a felon? Have you been? Are you a felon? <laughs> Uh, are you, or have you been committed to a mental institution? Are you a domestic abuser? How big is your penis? How clean is your vagina? The wrong answer on those first two questions means you're probably never getting an M16. I guess first three questions. Uh, the wrong answer on those uh, second two questions or the last two questions means you're probably going to spend most of your life alone. Uh, other than a few parking tickets, are you a citizen in good standing? Uh, no. Well, then good luck getting approval. Even if you're Johnny by the book, a record of civic responsibility is also still not a guarantee of immediate approval. Uh, every application apparently varies uh, as far as length, but the average time seems to take between nine months and a year uh, because the people at the ATF, they take their time. They want to make certain uh, sure that certain applicants you know, have dotted their I's, crossed their T's, and that they're considered safe and responsible to own a fully auto firearm. Uh, assuming one has the record and the patience to pass the background check along with the actual cast to purchase the firearm and finally does get the gun, now that person finds themselves subject to a host of new regulations. The ATF registers the new fully automatic gun owner. They notify local law enforcement of the name and address of the person who owns it, and they strictly regulate the transportation of these weapons. If a civilian wants to cross state lines with their new purchase, they have to apply for permission. It can take weeks, if not months, to get that permission granted. Uh, you know, like if they want to attend like the big Sandy machine gun shoot in Arizona, it happens annually. An important note about the M16, no M16 has been used in any of the recent school or public shootings. Okay, so let's talk about some recent shootings and the types of guns that were used during those shootings since that seems to be the main point of contention right now. That's what all the recent high-profile, uh, high-ratio of celebrity cameo protests have been about. The Vegas shooter last year used several AR-15s, and he used AR-15s adapted with bump stocks. I'm sure you've heard that term now. The bump stocks he purchased online allowed him to fire as many as nine rounds per second. And they can be bought in many different forms on the internet. And without bump stocks added to numerous AR-15s he owned, he wouldn't have been able to light up over 500 people on October 1st at the Harvick Music Festival. And bump stocks, looks like those are going away. We'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, the AR-15 and other semi-automatic rifles can be modified with these devices to become fully auto by harnessing a gun's natural recoil, allowing it to bounce back and forth off a shooter's trigger finger. And one bump stock uh, can unleash up to 100 rounds in seven seconds, according to an ad I found on slidefire.com. Uh, again, probably going to have authorities question me about my Google history here shortly. Uh, if all of a sudden the podcast just go away, just assume that I'm being de detained somewhere. Uh, the recent Parkland High School shooter also used an AR-15, killing 17 people. The Sandy Hook shooter used an AR-15, killing 27. Neither of those AR-15s had bump stocks. The Columbine shooters did not have AR-15s. They had shotguns. One had a semi-automatic high point 995 carbine, a 9mm with 13 10-round magazines. And the other had a Tech 9 semi automatic handgun with 152, 132, and 128 round magazine. Okay, I keep throwing around these terms. What is a magazine? Time for some more terms. Big thanks to some of my time sucker gun aficionados for making sure I got these terms correct uh, this week. I know in some past episodes I, I messed them up. So let's talk about a magazine. A magazine, uh, the definition is a periodical publication containing articles and illustrations typically covering a particular subject or area of interest. Something you read for information like Esquire or Popular Mechanics or Hustler or Swank or Bound and Gagged. Now, those are different kinds of magazines. Some of those examples actually are, are very different types of magazines. Uh, a gun magazine is an ammunition storage and feeding device within or attached to a repeating firearm. Magazines can be removable. They can be detachable or integral. They can be internal fixed. 
to the firearm. Various jurisdictions ban what they define as high-capacity magazines. For example, in California, as of July 1st, 2017, you can no longer legally possess a magazine that holds more than 10 bullets. Idaho has uh, zero regulations on high-capacity magazines. Again, Idaho, you can kind of just do what you want. Uh, Previously on an old episode of The Suck, I called a magazine a clip. So what is a clip? A clip can reference a device that is used to store multiple rounds of ammunition together as a unit, ready for insertion into the magazine or cylinder of a firearm. Speeds up the process of loading and reloading the firearm as several rounds can be loaded at once rather than one round being loaded at a time. So you can have a bunch of, you know, bullets like a, you know, a big clip of bullets as opposed to having to put in each bullet at a time into the magazine. Okay, so now back to weapons used in high-profile public shootings. The Virginia Tech shooter used a Glock 19 pistol and a Walt, Walther P22 pistol, uh, no AR-15, no rifle of any kind. A Glock 19, uh, widely used in law enforcement, has a standard magazine capacity of 17 rounds, and you have to pull the trigger to fire each and every shot. The P22 comes with a factory magazine of 10 rounds, highest capacity upgrade I could find in my many searches, uh, was up to 15 rounds. And with these two handguns, the shooter killed 32 people. Important to note for today's discussion, that no assault rifle was used in that particular attack. Uh, There was the Pulse nightclub shooting of 2016. 49 people killed, another 58 wounded. The shooter did use an assault rifle, also a handgun. He used a a, a Sig Sauer uh, MCX, semi-automatic 223 caliber rifle with a 30-round magazine, no bump stock. Used a 9mm Glock semi-automatic pistol uh, with a standard magazine capacity, again, of 17 rounds, just like the the Virginia Tech guy. Uh, there was the 2017 Sutherland Springs church shooting. Uh, 26 people died. Another 20 are wounded. The shooter used a Ruger model AR-556 AR rifle. Come standard with a 30-round magazine. The killer did not use a bump stock uh, that day, uh, but you you could get a bump stock for that rifle. It can, it can simulate automatic fire. I watched a YouTube clip where a guy fired 41 rounds in about four seconds with one of those adaptations. 2015, a married couple opened fire on an employee gathering taking place uh, at Inland Regional Center in San Bernardino, California, killing 14 people. They did so with two semi-automatic rifles modified to become fully auto. There was a 223 caliber Smith & Wesson M&P 15 modified to become a fully auto and a 223 caliber DP or D, yeah, DPMS A15 modified to accept a high-capacity magazine to bypass the so-called bullet button, which makes removing a magazine easier. Uh, there was the Umpqua Community College, uh, you know, massacre in Roseburg, Oregon in 2015. A shooter killed nine people, injured another nine, then was killed by police in a shootout. Good riddance, motherfucker. Six weapons uh, recovered at the school, five handguns, and an AR-15. And I could go on and on and on. The Aurora school shooter in Colorado, the Binghamton, New York shooter, some shooters from the uh, years past, like a guy who just walked down 32nd Street in Camden, New Jersey in 1949 and shot and killed 13 people with a Luger pistol. Uh, so when you look at the incidents of public mass shootings, first off, you notice there's been a lot recently. I found a list of the deadliest single day shootings from 1949 until the present. The list included 34 incidents in which eight or more people were killed in some public place in one day. The top five deadliest incidents have all occurred since 2007. All but eight of the incidents have occurred since 1982. Only two incidents occurred between 1949 and in 1982, two in a span of 34 years, less than 0.06 mass shootings per year. 17 of the shootings have occurred in the last 10 years, 1.7 a year, right? Over 28 times the frequency. That is important to think about. Why now? Right? Like why now? The AR-15 has been on the civilian gun market since 1964. Why weren't shooters lighting up schools in public events, public places between 1964 and 1982? This is very concerning to me. And, and I think we should keep that in mind as we break down arguments for and against firearms. The most far left argument, again, is that guns are bad. Guns kill people. Guns are killing students. True. You know, killing innocent people. True. Uh, and, and without guns, the victims of gun violence would be alive today, which is true. But let's look at those stats. We're going to look at a lot of stats, really pay attention as much as you can to this part. I think it's really important. Between 2006, 2016, almost 6,885 people in the U.S. died from unintentional shootings. Accidental gun deaths occur mainly in those under 25 years old of age, 2014. Almost uh, 2,600 kids between the ages of 0 and 19 died by gunshot. An additional 
13,576 were injured. In the U.S., over 1.69 million kids age 18 and under are living in households with loaded and unlocked firearms, setting the scene for possible tragedy. A 2001 study found that regardless of age, people are nine times more likely to die from unintentional firearm injuries when they live in states with more guns. Makes sense. 2015, 36,252 people died from firearms, 11.3 for every 100,000 people. This includes everything from hunting accidents to suicide to gang violence. For comparison, 36,161 died in traffic-related incidents, 57,567 died in poisoning-related deaths, and almost 600,000 people died from cancer. Cancer. Now, based on some of those stats, the argument can be made that you know one death from gun violence is too many, and we need to get rid of just get rid of the guns, right? Well, not that simple. Because what about the lives that guns save? I feel like this does not get brought up very much at all right now in the media. Uh, definitely not on the left. I guess it's just very quickly dismissed. I guess it's just not a sexy media angle. Maybe maybe they think it's too complex to kind of dive into, but but we're going to look at it. A lot of gun owners rationalize gun ownership, especially on the right, you know, when it comes to assault weapons on the basis of defending one's home and family in case of a break-in and in just, you know, kind of life in, in, in general. Is there merit to that argument? Well, let's look at some numbers. This is a fear I've had myself. Here's some interesting stats I gathered from the Department of Justice uh, summarized in a, in a comprehensive 2010 governmental report. An estimated 3.7 million household burglaries occurred each year on average from 2003 to 2007. And 7% of all household burglaries during that time, a household member experienced some sort of violent victimization. So a household member became a victim of a violent crime in 266,560 burglaries in that time period. Simple assault, 15% of of those was the most common form of violence when a resident was home and violence occurred. Robbery accounted for 7% of the violence. Rape accounted for 3%. So over a five-year period, That's roughly 8,000 home invasion rapes, 8,000 rapes, roughly, that that have been reported, roughly 40,000 violent assaults, 40,000. Think about those numbers. And these numbers weren't pulled from wackadoodle dot fucking happy trigger finger or get off my property dot I'll blow your goddamn head off. You know, if if you're wondering why you haven't heard about stats like this, again, it's just, you know, these, these crimes don't tend to make the news. There's too many to report. A classmate I knew in college was raped by a stranger during a home invasion, never made the news. Uh, if I, if I didn't, you know, wasn't, you know, kind of good friends with her friend, I don't think I would have ever even heard about it on campus. 30% of individuals experiencing violence during a completed burglary faced an armed offender. Uh, and by the way, I did know personally other girls who were raped on campus by strangers. So, I mean, it's just, yeah, it's, it's crazy how often this stuff does happen. Offenders were armed with a firearm in 23% of burglaries in households, uh, burglarized by a stranger where violence occurred. Unfortunately, the study I found, uh, these stats within did not have stats regarding how many of the homeowners being burglarized were armed, which does make you wonder if, if some of these you know, stats are a little bit politically motivated. It could just be you know, simple human oversight. I mean, the Department of Justice and the FBI have so many stats when it comes to crime, but almost no stats when it comes to crimes deterred, which, which is harder to gather, I, I, I do admit. Uh, specifically, it uh, doesn't have anything you know, with like, crimes deterred by the, the use or the mere presence of a gun, and that's important. Because sometimes, you know, uh, on the left, the stats will be, you know, pointed to where it's like, yes, but like how often were shots fired at somebody during a break-in? To me, that's not the important thing. How often was a gun, you know, uh, held by the gun owner who then yelled, get out of here, I'm going to shoot you? How many times did that happen? Because that is important. There was a study completed in 2008 under the Obama administration called Priorities for Research to Reduce the Threat of Firearm-Related Violence, which was investigated, researched, and written by the Institute of Medicine and by the National Research Council under funding provided by the National Academy of Sciences and both the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the CDC Foundation. So, you know, a lot of big words, very important study. Within that study, the following piece of information is given. Defensive use of guns by crime victims is a common occurrence, although the exact number remains disputed. Almost all national survey estimates indicate the defensive gun uses by victims are at least as common as offensive uses by criminals with estimates of annual use ranging from about 500,000 to more than 3 million in the context of about 300,000 violent crimes involving involving firearms in 2008. That's an important bit of info. What if, just what if, a half a million crimes are truly prevented each year by the presence of a firearm? Using the earlier stat of 7% of break-ins involving violence, 3% of that violence being rape, that's 35,000 violent crimes prevented and over 1,000 rapes prevented in just one year. 
How many people are killed during home invasions? According to the FBI, uh, roughly 86 a year. How many of those deaths involved an armed homeowner versus an unarmed homeowner? Unfortunately, no data for that exists. Uh, I mean, and, and don't the lives protected by guns matter just as much as the lives taken by them? It's something I feel like a lot of people just don't want to fucking talk about, and it drives me crazy right now. You know, because it is a celebrity, you would get, you know, uh, torn apart by the left if you fucking said that. Like, you're an idiot, even though the people saying you're an idiot have no fucking stats at all to back up their opinions. Uh, in, in my experience, from what I've been really seeing, it's been really frustrating this past week. So now let's look at another argument. More guns equals uh, more death. That seems true, but but is it? Some interesting stats here. The state with the most machine guns per capita is New Hampshire. With 7.4 for every 1,000 residents, New Hampshire also happens to have the lowest murder rate. Overall, New Hampshire has the 13th most guns per capita, 14.6 per 1,000 residents. New York has the least amount of guns per capita, 3.3 guns for every 1,000 residents. It has the 34th highest murder rate. So, you know, uh, Idaho is number six with 24.2 guns per 1,000 residents, six most guns per capita, 36 highest per capita murder rate. Wyoming, number one by far. 195.7 195.7 guns for every 1,000 residents. Now, to be fair, there's only about 2,000 people in Wyoming. Uh, no, it does have a small population. Uh, 582,658 is the last census. Only the 33rd highest murder rate. Most guns by far. By far. Uh, 33rd highest murder rate. So as you can see, there's not a strong statistical correlation between more guns per capita and more overall murder. There just isn't. So clearly there are a lot of other factors that go into murder per capita than the amount of guns on the market. The numbers don't lie. And these stats, again, are pulled you know, from the FBI, not from, you know, buy my machine gun, dot it comes with a grenade launcher, or Armageddon weapons for the modern man, dot booyah, motherfucker. So, I mean, you could say yes, but those murder numbers aren't gun-specific murder numbers. Obviously, in states with more guns, there is going to be more gun-specific murders. There are going to be more pool-related deaths uh, more drownings in states with more pools, right? Uh, obviously. I don't think that's the important thing to focus on, though. Isn't the overall murder rate what's important? The overall saving of life or loss of life, what we really should be talking about. Another argument I hear a lot is comparing violent deaths in the U.S. to violent deaths and in and, and other similar nations like the U.K., Australia, Canada. You know, our countries with less guns actually safer overall from violent crime. Of course, they're going to be safer from gun violence. Again, they have less guns. Again, going back to the pool analogy. But if you're being murdered, I I doubt you think something like, oh, thank God I'm being stabbed right now instead of being shot. Oh, I'm sure glad there aren't as many guns in my country. This is a much safer violent death I'm experiencing right now. So let's look into it. How does gun ownership compare between the U.S. and the rest of the world? And then how does that correlate with murder rates? Small Arms Survey is a research project run by Swiss University that publishes a ranking of estimated civilian gun ownership by country. Uh, it's actually yeah, it's really, really great stuff out there with this uh, survey. According to their data, the U.S. has the most guns per capita of any nation in the world by far, with 88.8 guns for every 100 residents. Yemen is number two, with 54.8 guns for every 100 residents, and you will never guess number three unless you've already heard about it from some article. Uh, Switzerland. Yeah, I swear. Neutral old Switzerland has 45.7 guns for every 100 residents. And here I thought they were just focused on some kick-ass milk chocolate, and Ricola. Uh, Finland has 45.3 guns for every 100 residents. Another interesting one, Sweden, 31.6 guns for every 100 residents. You know, there's a lot of hunters in, in some of those countries. Uh, so let's look at the countries with the highest murder rates in the world. Now, th- th- here's some 2013 stats. Honduras, number one, 74.6 murders for every 100,000 people. El Salvador, second with 64.2. A lot of that is gang-related. Uh, Drug trade related. Venezuela third with 62. The United States um, is is, – right now is 3.9. Yemen, 6.7. Switzerland, 0.5. I guess that from 2013 it was 3.9. Think about that stat. Switzerland has the third most guns per capita but the lowest crime rate in the world. Lower than the UK. The UK has 0.9 murders per 100,000. Yeah, lower than Canada's rate of 1.4. Lower than Australia's rate of 1. Uh, gun-related deaths per capita are higher in Switzerland and elsewhere in Europe, 3.1 per 100,000 uh, compared to the next highest, 2.9 for Austria and 2.65 for France. Um, makes sense. They have more guns than anywhere else in Europe, but overall, homicide lower than anywhere else in Europe. This is very important. And, and a lot of the, and most of those deaths in, uh, from guns, like in Switzerland, that I read about suicides. So 
the you know suicides who chose to use the gun. Uh, so maybe coincidence. I don't know. Uh, also, maybe there's less overall murders because people are afraid of being shot if they try to commit a murder. I mean, I feel like you have to at least consider that thought. Also, most of Switzerland gun deaths, uh, again, are, yeah, are suicides. So even the, within the stat there I just threw out there, you know, you could argue that those people would have killed themselves just in a different manner if they didn't have a gun. Switzerland also ranked the fourth happiest country in the world in the two, 2017 World Happiness Report. Norway is number one. Denmark and Iceland are two and three. Finland, number six. Canada is eight. Australia is 11. The U.S. is 15th. U.K. is 20. Lots of guns, very very little violent crime, uh, lots of happiness. So let's take a look at how Switzerland's gun laws and gun culture compared to our own. But first, let's check in with another sponsor. Time Suck is brought to you today by Bojangles, House of Preposterous Prosthetic Weapons. Don't let the lack of a limb keep you from a needless amount of self-defense. At Bojangles, House of Preposterous Prosthetic Weapons, you can turn half an arm into a military-grade napalm dispenser capable of turning a serene woodland forest into a pile of ash and terror. You're not down to one eye. You're up a face-mounted laser able to melt through a five-inch thick steel safe in under five seconds. You're not missing two legs. You're just, you just needed to make room for a new grenade launcher and a hip-mounted Gatling gun, and those legs were holding you back. So come to Bojangles, house of preposterous prosthetic weapons. Use the promo code TIMESUCK. Get a 20% better than normal chance of Bojangles not beating the shit out of you not beating you unconscious because he thinks you work for the feds and that you're trying to shut down a highly illegal arms business. Bojangles, the one-eyed, three-legged, all-pitball guardian of Time Suck. Sorry, I know that was weird, especially if you're a first-time listener. Uh, We're done with sponsors today. I I just need to take a moment, just take away from all the stats and away from the heaviness of today's topic. I had had to make it weird for a second. Okay, all right. I'm back. Back to Switzerland. The country has about 2 million privately owned guns in a nation of 8.3 million people. In 2016, the country had 47 hom- homicides with firearms. Why aren't there, or wh- yeah, why aren't there, you know, few, why are there fewer related gun deaths there? There hasn't been a, a mass shooting since 2001. Well, first off, there doesn't seem to be a culture of fear around guns in Switzerland like there is here. I've known people, many people who are legitimately afraid to hold or even touch a gun, as if the gun will just jump up and shoot them in the face by itself uh, or, or compel them to kill everyone they know and love. There's so much emotion around guns in America, such a charged issue, so much fear. That doesn't seem to be the case in Switzerland. It seems much more cold and logical. Swiss children are encouraged to come to gun clubs where they're taught to respect guns. One Swiss gun club member says, a lot of hyperactive children come to the rifle club. They learn to stand still, to concentrate for much longer, and it helps them get better results in school and in life. That's an interesting thought. Uh, The government holds an annual shooting contest focusing on accurate marksmanship for kids 13 to 17. It's a big deal with massive participation. Around 4,000 kids compete each year in Zurich. Uh, Men are actually required to learn how to use guns in Switzerland because they have to serve in the military. Swiss males have to serve at least a total of 260 days uh, in the armed forces beginning at the age of 18. They receive 18 weeks of mandatory training, followed by seven three-week intermittent recalls for training during the next 10 years. And that training includes firearms training. And women can volunteer to receive the same training. Swiss, Swiss authorities have a list of about 2,000 individuals they suspect of being willing to commit shootings. All of them are frequently approached by authorities along with psychologists and are forced to hand over their weapons immediately and, and, and are barred from purchasing new ones if they make that list. And I got to say, I like the basic premise of that idea. I hate it when there's a public shooting and then all of a sudden the media uncovers all these dumb shit photos of the shooter holding an AR-15 or some similar weapon, you know, uh, in some social media post with comments like, kill them all. You know, if you're posting a bunch of photos of yourself with assault rifles all over fucking Facebook or Instagram, and you're making vague threats, you need to have your fucking head examined and you need to have your guns taken away, you stupid son of a bitch. You know, I'd be totally comfortable with you getting put on a list, you know, of uh, people authorities check up on a little more regularly. Uh, yeah, some, soci- some sociologists say that Switzerland's military service has a lot to do with lower rates of gun violence. Mandatory service allows authorities to do an extended background check on most citizens. Also, Swiss culture may have a lot to do with lower murder levels. The country's education system teaches kids uh, early on to search for compromises instead of risking open conflicts. Uh, Hence, while most every home in Switzerland may have a weapon, access is still indirectly regulated and the use of weapons usually follows strict societal norms. Uh, Then there's the question of what Swiss guns uh, are meant to defend against. The Swiss government, uh, you know, the Swiss are sorry, they trust their government more than citizens of other rich countries tend to trust theirs. So this tradition of gun ownership and it rose in Switzerland more from a historic need to protect Switzerland from invaders 
uh, then from the hypothetical need to overthrow its own, you know, tyrannical government. And people are taught to like put their bullets and, and you know, and, and actual uh, firearms in separate places. Very different attitude. Also, while Switzerland has very relaxed gun laws compared to many of the world's nations, uh, th- they're not as relaxed as the U.S. laws. Uh, in Switzerland, semi-automatic, ri- semi-automatic rifles are legal. Grenades and fully auto rifles are not. And, and again, there's, as you've seen, there's tighter overall regulation. Uh, including Swiss authorities being able to decide on a local level whether to give people gun permits based on factors which include current psychological health. They also keep a log of everyone who owns a gun in their region, known as a canton, uh, though hunting rifles and some semi-automatic long arms are exempt from the permit requirement. Uh, cantonal peace, uh, police don't take their duty doling out gun licenses lightly. Uh, they might consult a psychiatrist, talk with authorities in other cantons about you know where a prospective buyer or gun buyer has lived before to really vet the person before giving them a license. People who've been convicted of a crime or of alcohol or drug addiction are not allowed to buy guns in Switzerland. The law also states that anyone who expresses a violent or dangerous attitude will not be permitted to own a gun. Uh, Guessing that law weeds out those fucking internet nuts I was talking about earlier. Uh, Gun owners who want to carry their weapon for defensive purposes also have to prove they can properly load, unload, and shoot their weapon must pass a test to get a license. I love that. If you're going to be a gun owner, for fuck's sake, know how to use your gun. Nothing worse than being around some jackass who doesn't take firearm safety seriously when you're hunting or shooting targets. I know. I have been that jackass. And my grandpa and stepdad have yelled at me to watch where the hell I'm pointing a rifle, uh, where I'm standing or shooting, right? Because that stuff is obviously very important. Okay, so what about current gun laws in America? What regulations do we have in place right now? Well, for starters, President Trump moved to ban bump stocks just last week, and I think that's pretty awesome, you know? Give credit where credit is due. This is something. This past Friday, the U.S. Department of Justice filed a regulation that will prohibit the devices fulfilling Trump's request to do so. The regulation would classify these devices as banned machine guns under current federal law. The regulation will now undergo a 90-day period for public comments, after which it could be changed or go into effect as is. As we stated earlier, under federal law, fully automatic weapons are technically legal only if made before 86. When Congress passed the Firearm Owners Protection Act, it's illegal to manufacture new auto weapons or automatic weapons for civilian use. President Trump is also proposing several new laws to tighten up gun control, such as improving reporting to the background check system, which is a big problem right now, and raising the legal age for purchasing assault-style weapons from 18 to 21. Under federal law, licensed dealers may not sell a handgun to anyone below the age of 21, according to the Giffords Law Center, but the limit is only 18 for these same licensed dealers when it comes to long guns shotguns and, and rifles, and including assault weapons. So there are background checks required for various gun purchases in the U.S., but, uh, you know, th- these, these policies are underfunded, they're underenforced. For example, uh, although there are no waiting periods under federal law right now, a check that turns out inconclusive can be extended for three business days for further investigation, but these three days are a maximum for the government, and sometimes the three days lapse without the FBI completing this check because they just don't have the manpower, Uh, A buyer can, at that point, purchase a gun without the completed check, which is not good. The Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives is the agency that licenses uh, gun dealers. The ATF defines dealers as people who repetitively buy and sell firearms with the principal motive of making a profit. The ATF says that people who make occasional sales of firearms from your personal collection do not need to be licensed. The agency focuses on whether the seller presents him or herself as a dealer for example, if the seller is advertising, has a business card, or accepts credit cards, the ATF would see those as signs of a professional dealer. Restocking inventory also a sign. And the ATF says all dealers must be licensed regardless of whether they're selling guns in cyberspace, at gun shows, or at brick-and-mortar stores. In some states, unlicensed sellers can make private sales without conducting a background check, which is fucked up. Uh, all federally licensed gun dealers must run checks on every buyer, whether a purchase is made in a store or at a gun show. And that check works like this. A buyer presents his or her ID to the seller, fills out an ATF form, form 4473, with personal info, such as age, address, race, criminal history, if any. The seller then submits the information to the FBI via a toll-free phone line or over the internet. The agency checks the applicant's info against databases, and the process can take as little as a few minutes. And again, required information includes name, address, place of birth, race, citizenship, social security number is optional, although it's recommended. The form asks questions such as, have you been convicted of a felony? Have you been convicted uh, convicted of a misdemeanor crime of domestic violence? Are you an unlawful user of or addicted to marijuana or any other depressant, stimulant, narcotic drug, or any other controlled substance? Are you a fugitive from justice? Have you ever been committed to a mental institution? I wonder if the history of that check, anyone who didn't have something on their record, 
uh, just was like, oh, no, yeah, no, I'm doing a lot of blow right now. I haven't been arrested, but I do coke, uh, I would say three, four times a week. I doubt that's ever happened. Of course, many guns are bought and sold illegally. Others are sold legally, but without background checks, since the system is only used by gun sellers, again, with a federal license, the federal government does not track nationwide gun sales. Reliable data on how many sold is scarce. Uh, a time sucker I've known for a bit now, who's, who's been a cop out somewhere in the Midwest, going to keep it a little vague for him, good dude named Nate Nolte, uh, who has served and protected for many years, had some interesting thoughts about private sellers. He wrote me saying, believe it or not, my views have actually slid to the left on gun control over the years due mainly due to my time as a cop. I used to be a big fan of private sales, you know, which is where an individual can sell to another individual in a state with no checks. As long as, this, you know, each show a valid ID and, and can attest that they can legally own it, it's a good sale. It's, it's legal. You know, uh, this is what's called the gun show loophole. And at one point I was all for it, did it myself, but now I'm 100% against it. Because basically anyone with a state ID can lie to a guy walking around and buy a gun. Think about that. Scary. I have no problem with person to person sales. I just believe it should have to go through a dealer and background check so it's legal. This is where I differ from many on this issue. A lot of people say, well, that's illegal if he lied, so it's not a loophole. Yeah, sure, but the bad guy still gets the gun and this could easily be stopped. We have gun shows here monthly where I live. Uh, normally don't go to them anymore. You have these guys walking around, we call hawks, and they try to buy low from people when they walk in and then turn around and sell them to someone else. This is extremely illegal, yet they do it. Maybe not right away, but the next day. They can, they can say they took it home, didn't like it, changed their mind, whatever. I've seen these guys do it. They don't care who they sell to. The gun show loophole is a big topic, so I figured if you haven't ran into it yet, I would let you know about it and explain it in the easiest way. Well, thank you, Nate, and thank you uh, for sharing that, not just with me, but with us all. So as you can see, laws concerning guns here in America and the enforcement of them, a little bit wonky. Not the best system right now. Not an airtight system for sure, and that's a problem. Let's talk about mental health for a second. I'm, uh, I'm against it. Uh, I've been crazy my entire life, and I plan on staying that way and making as many other people as fucking crazy as possible. Wait, no, wait, wait, what? No, let's talk about mental health as it pertains to gun control. <clears throat> Excuse me. So many of these shooters seem, as I've said before with my stand-up, to be photogenically insane. As in, you can diagnose some sort of mental illness by looking at a picture of them. But I wonder how they got a hold of guns in the first place. And that made me wonder, what laws do we have in place regarding mental health and gun control? Well, under federal law, a person can be tallied in a database that uh, and barred from purchasing or possessing a firearm due to mental illness under two conditions. If he or she is involuntarily committed to a mental hospital or if a court or government body declares them to be mentally incompetent. In many states, including Florida, law enforcement can take an individual to a mental hospital against their will for initial evaluation. If after 72 hours, the doctors observing the individual want to continue that treatment, they can petition a court for permission even against the patient's wishes. That a court order allowing a person's continued involuntary institu institutionalization is one thing that should stop an individual from purchasing a firearm. If the person was taken uh, in, in for mental treatment involuntarily but was not requested to be held past 72 hours, they're not blocked from buying any guns. Uh, a licensed gun dealer is required under federal law to run potential buyers through the criminal background check system. And again, that's that quick process. It takes a few minutes. And if all the records are in the right place, you know, this would prevent a purchaser who was previously involuntarily committed or, or educated as mentally incompetent from getting a gun. But federal law doesn't require states to make these mental health records part of the background check system. So many fail to voluntarily report the records. So a lot of times when people are committed, they still can buy a gun because when they do the background check, nothing shows up. Uh, yeah. And again, you know, like we've been saying, there's these private, you know, gun sales. You know, you don't have to just go through a licensed shop. You can buy guns, you know, from someone online in a classified ad. You can buy from a fucking yard sale. Bite off a street corner. <laughs> you know, uh, this just doesn't seem to, to be a great idea. And again, laws vary wildly from state to state. It's not like anyone in the state line is also checking your vehicle to make sure that the gun legal in your state is legal in their state. It's a big problem. It's, everything is incredibly fucking confusing. You know, the laws vary wildly. So does enforcement. So what's the answer? What do we do? I wish I knew. I'll share some final thoughts and re-summarize what I've already laid out. But first, let's check in with some people who, who know exactly what to do with guns. Let's check in with some idiots of the internet. Idiots of the internet. 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 I went to a video today uh, published on February 17th of this year. Uh, the video was posted by CNN, and the title is Florida Student to NRA and Trump We Call BS. It's Parkland High School shooting survivor Emma Gonzalez. She's been in the news a lot lately. The young woman with the shaved head who has become the face of the current call for gun control. Now, the video has almost 3 million views, over 60,000 comments, and one of the first comments I read 
is from YouTuber Levi Parento, who posts, never trust anyone who looks like they've just been deloused. And then under this comment, uh, YouTuber Digenous Unknown posts, it doesn't matter how old you are or where you came from or what you look like. Okay. Okay, comment looks looking promising so far. Looks like he's going to stand up for Emma, right? Then, he, then they continue. Any scum of the earth who threatens their fellow human beings with taking away the right of self-defense is not deserving of one iota of respect. Oh, man. They both shit on Emma. And look, full disclosure, I don't agree with a lot of what Emma has been saying. Uh, I don't think it's realistic just to get rid of guns in America, but I certainly don't hate Emma, and I certainly don't want to disrespect her. She's a fucking high school kid grieving the recent violent deaths of her classmates. Jesus Christ. She was almost killed herself. Of course she's going to be very anti-gun right now. Can you blame her? I can't. And, and why can't you respect someone whose opinion differs a little bit from your own? I realize how truly important it is uh, more and more to listen to the other side. Unless it's flat earth. Uh, <laughs> we got to stop playing <laughs> playing these liberals versus conservatives bullshit games, you know? And, and that's what it is. It's a, it's a silly game. The real answer is usually in the middle of most of this stuff, you know, when, it, when it's not, you know, obvious, a scientific kind of discussion. And, and you never get to hear the middle if you're only talking to people on your extreme, you know, side of, of the issue. A uh, user Dolores Pritchard leaves the following comment under this video. She, she posts, does anyone know why Germany did not invade Switzerland in World War II? They decided it would not be advantageous since nearly every adult male has an automatic rifle and pistol. Most still do. Maybe, young lady, you should, you should research why their society is different from ours. There lies the problem, dear. Ban guns and they will make more effective weapons such as bombs. I got to say, Dolores, I fucking love you. With the name Dolores, you may be a thousand years old, but I don't care. If Lindsay ever leaves me, look me up, Dolores. Uh, I like the smart headrest on your shoulders. Just, just, just include in this comment because it leads me to what I want to talk about uh, at the end of the episode. Uh, user Heart Bleeds for You brings up another interesting point, posting, Japan has not had mass shooting, but they have had mass stabbings. In 2016, a man with a knife killed 16 people, thus proving you don't need a gun to kill a bunch of people. Now, this, this really is a great point. And actually, in the incident the poster is talking about, the killer stabbed 19 people to death and wounded another 26. The killer was an employee of a facility for the mentally disabled, and, and those are who he attacked. Uh, so sad. Guns aren't the only weapons that can be used in an attack on a school. The deadliest school attack in U.S. history actually occurred in the little town of Bath, Michigan, in 1927, when a 55-year-old school board treasurer dynamited the school he was on the board of and killed 44 students and faculty, injured 58 others. He didn't light up the place in a hail of bullets. He blew them the fuck up. But this section is supposed to be for stupid comments, right? Okay, yeah. Here's one. User Flat Earth <laughs> User Flat Earth Revolution Revolution posts, I'm sick of this girl's damn mouth. Thanks, Flat Earth. Uh, that really needed to be posted. Also, it's damn with an N in this context. Unless you think her mouth is a barrier constructed to hold back water and raise its level, the resulting reservoir being used in the generation of electricity or as a water supply. I'm guessing you were going for D A M N, which means to condemn especially by the public expression of disapproval. As in, I bet someone with the YouTube handle of Flat Earth Revolution doesn't have one damn intelligent thing to say about anything ever. All right, one more dummy. User CJ Hud goes full false flag saying, Emma is a good actor, exclamation point. I am so fucking tired of this false flag shit. And I'm not someone who thinks banning guns is the answer, but, but, which I'm going to talk about in a sec. But when you think this is all part of some Illuminati New World Order covert plan that these victims are just people paid to pretend they were involved in a shooting that never happened, well, then you've gone full David Icke wackadoodle. Shut the fuck up with the false flag stuff and actually have a grown-up conversation about these issues instead of just being another idiot of the internet. Idiots of the internet. Okay, so a lot of info today. Holy shit, so much. When I decided to do this topic, I, I was pretty certain I was going to piss off a lot of my conservative listeners, uh, uh, again, to be fair. But I may have pissed off some some more liberal listeners instead and, and some younger listeners. Uh, not trying to. Uh, I understand the emotion behind you know many of you teenagers taking to the streets with signs that say stuff like fear has no place in our schools. Enough is enough. Gun control now. Ban assault weapons. Inaction is cowardly. Gun reform now. And I love that you're doing it. I love that you're bringing this issue to uh, the nation's awareness. And, and I do think some gun reform needs to occur. I do. Uh, first off, I think our government has to do a much better job enforcing existing laws, like with the background checks. That's crazy how shitty that is right now. 
I also think private sellers at gun shows should be held to much tighter federal regulations. And I think if you want certain assault-style weapons like AR-15s, you should have to take a psychological evaluation and be held to a higher criminal standard than someone who buys like a, like a basic bolt-action, you know, deer rifle. Like the test you have to take to get an AR-15, you know, with a fucking under-the-barrel grenade launcher needs to be way more comprehensive than the test you need to take for a 22 bolt bolt-action rifle. There should be different tests for different classes of weapons, just like there are different types of driver's license tests for different driver's license uh, licenses. And like with the Swiss, I think you should have to be tested on gun safety and, and, and general gun knowledge, much like we're tested to get a driver's license. Again, it's a big responsibility to drive a car. Cars kill more people than guns. They're dangerous. You can't just legally drive around, you know, without passing a test. And I think it should be the same way for, you know, a rifle. You know, the answer to when do you get to light up your enemies with an AR-15 isn't the next time I see him at the mall. And if that's how you fucking answer the test, then you're on a watch list forever, you dumb son of a bitch. Uh, when it comes to banning guns entirely, while I personally don't think anyone needs an AR-15 or similar rifle, it's a bit too much firepower, uh, firepower for one person, in my opinion, I'm not convinced that banning them is going to make a big difference. I I I'm really not. It might not make any difference. I wouldn't feel safer in society after a ban. Like, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't feel like my two kids, both of whom go to public school, are going to be safer. Uh, I know some of uh, some of the Australian time suckers have written in about how Australia changed its gun culture, and that made it, uh, you know, uh, a much safer place to live in. Uh, on that, Australia introduced, it, it introduced a comprehensive gun control regime after a massacre in Tasmania in 1996. It was the Port Arthur massacre. 35 people were killed, 23 wounded. When a single shooter opened fire in a cafe with a Colt AR-15 SP-1 carbine, uh, which is a semi-automatic rifle, less than two weeks after the Port Arthur massacre, all six Australian states agreed to enact the same sweeping gun laws, banning semi-automatic rifles and shotguns. They also put more hurdles between prospective gun owners and their weapons. Australia has a 28-day a uh, waiting period now. Thorough background checks, a requirement to present a justifiable reason to own a gun. And mass shootings there have dropped to zero since that happened. You'll see that headline all over the place. Mass you know, shootings then dropped to zero. But what that headline doesn't include is the fact that there was never a comparable attack on Australian you know, uh, public before the Port Arthur massacre in Australia's history. Like fucking not ever. It's not like the Port Arthur shooting was the last of many public mass shootings. It was the only one of its nature in Australian history. There were other mass murders committed on the uh, Aborigines. Uh, there were some crazy arson killings, some biker gang shootouts. Other random criminal stuff, but nothing like one dude just going up into butchering strangers with a semi-automatic rifle. Uh, not nearly to that degree. And, and the weapons used in the Port Arthur attack had been around for years and years and years before the attack. So, again, you know, it was an isolated incident. So that headline, to me, is virtually meaningless and just blatantly misleading. After the attack, the Australian government brought back uh, now illegal guns or bought back illegal guns from citizens. The 1996 National Firearms Buyback Program took 660000 959 firearms out of, pri out of private hands, uh, compromising long guns, mostly semi-automatic rimfire rifles, shotguns, uh, pump action shotguns, smaller proportion of higher-powered military-type semi-automatic rifles. Uh, because the Australian Constitution requires the Commonwealth to pay just compensation for private property, uh, the government paid a fire fair price for all that stuff. They paid over $500 million in total. Over the next few years, eventually over a million guns were surrendered. surrendered. Then in 2003, additional gun control uh, regarding new handgun laws made illegal target pistols of greater than 38 caliber and handguns with barrels less than 120 millimeter, semi-automatic or 100 millimeter revolvers, such as pocket pistols. 2017, Australia had a national firearms amnesty, the first since 96, in which individuals could surrender illegal firearms for destruction without criminal penalty. Because if you're caught with an illegal firearm outside the amnesty period, you could face $280,000 in fines. Uh, 14 years in prison. So over 57,000 guns have been surrendered through that. And so have Australia's per capita homicide rates dropped since 96, the beginning of all this gun control? Yes, they have actually. Uh, 1996, homicides in Australia accounted for 1.6 murders for every 100,000 people. Right now, the rate is one murder for every 100,000 people. So they, they've uh, dropped substantially. Have manslaughter, sexual assault, kidnapping, and uh, uh, however, manslaughter, Sexual assault, kidnapping, and, and uh, all saw peaks in the years following the ban, as, as did armed robbery, and most remain near or above pre-ban rates. For example, figures from Victoria Police show a 51% increase in reported rapes over a 10-year period between uh, 2004 and 2014. Can you blame less guns for other crimes increasing? Not definitively, but is it possibly related? Maybe. And what about the reason for having guns in America in the first place? 
You know, what about that angle with this whole uh, issue we're talking about right now? What about the basic militia angle of keeping not only other governments from taking us over, but keeping our own government in check? Well, uh, the argument that an armed citizenry could stand up to to the government army, especially in this country, I got to say, is probably pretty weak. There just isn't good historical examples of this usually working out. You know, usually armed uprisings get squashed out because they have inferior firepower and are not organizationally prepared to stand up to a real army of far greater numbers and organizational capacity and ability. You know, there's probably not going to be some like uh, Red Dawn successful standoff. It's, it's probably going to be in reality more like Wolverines followed very shortly by, oh, shit. They have a lot of guys and a lot of guns. Man, I wish we had missiles and helicopters too. This is not looking good. Followed by, you know, uh, v- victory by the government. However, I do think this, I raise this. I know this make me, might make me sound crazy, but I got to throw it out here. If the economy were to totally collapse, if a catastrophic event were to occur, occur, if things got to a place where the government was no longer able to keep law and order, then, I mean, those with guns are going to be, you know, far more likely to survive. I mean, are you kidding me? I've joked about it in the past on some stand-up, but it is true. Resources get scarce, you know, lawlessness ensues. Who do you think is getting all the good stuff? Well, people with the most guns. Now, again, I, I know, probably never going to happen, but i just like to throw that out there. Uh, but small possibility. And another interesting thought to consider with all this, the fact that most public shootings have occurred in gun-free zones. Let's think about that. In another message, my police officer, time sucker Nate, brought up another important point. Mass shootings occurring in gun-free zones, right? I'm paraphrasing some of what he said here. He said, you might want to look into gun-free zones. That's pretty much where almost all the big shootings happen. Think about it. If you're going to kill people and want to be able to get the most bang for your buck, you're going to do it in a gun-free zone. The people there are basic lambs being led to the slaughter, be it schools, 99% gun-free, Movie theaters, most have signs saying no guns. Churches used to be gun-free, but now are changing rapidly. And people's uh, work, most employers do not allow their employees to carry. Now look at the above and think about it. Aurora Theater, recent church shootings in Texas, every school shooting, uh, some office attacks. You know, the, the, the attack where the guy went in and cut off a lady's head with a machete at her work. The San Bernardino shooting where a guy and his wife killed like 14 people during a work party. All those places have the same thing, this policy of no guns allowed. Unless you're a bad bad guy who doesn't care about that policy. This is a valid point to bring up. The gunmen are going after targets in areas where they know people don't have guns. I was, I was never worried about a mass shooting when I went to high school in Riggins, Idaho, because there was a parking lot full of trucks with gun racks and guns. Kids would go hunting after school, and if one kid decided to go crazy, you know, with a gun, some other kid is going to go to his truck, grab his rifle, and shoot that motherfucker long before the police show up. Or a teacher is going to grab their rifle or pistol from their car or truck. And I'm not advocating going back to that because I feel like times have changed more than weapons have changed. And and this is the thought I keep coming back to. You know, do I think we should uh, enforce better background checks and more criminal and psychological restrictions on certain classes of weapons? I do. I hope they raise the age on who can buy semi-automatic weapons to to at least 21. I wouldn't mind 25, right? It's how old you have to be to to rent a car. And again, I know that's easy for me to say when I'm 40. Uh, However, I also think focusing on getting rid of one type of gun is focusing on the Band-Aid and not focusing on the wound. Why is this shit happening more in the United States than other countries? There are plenty of other countries that have plenty of weapons. Just because a weapon isn't legal doesn't mean a country doesn't have them. In Australia's recent gun amnesty hand in last year, a fucking rocket launcher was handed over, as were numerous machine guns that have been out there this whole time. Mass shootings are on the upswing, even as other types of homicides and violent crimes have become less frequent in the U.S. In the U.S., there have now been at least 62 mass shootings in the past three decades, with 24 in the last seven years alone, according to a recent Mother Jones survey. This has happened even as the nation's overall violent crime and homicide rates have been dropping. What is the explanation for the rise in mass shootings? One theory is that certain types of killing sprees are somehow contagious. Back in 1999, four public health researchers published a famous study called Media and Mass Homicides in the Archives of Suicide Research. They studied a series of mass homicides in Australia, New Zealand, and Britain in the 80s and 90s and found that different incidents appeared to be influenced by each other in a number of ways, often spanning many years and across continents. The idea that one violent rampage might inspire another has given rise to plenty of articles and papers about whether the press should be more conscientious in the way it reports on these events. Given a murder, too much publicity might be a bad idea, and I agree. I think we should slander mass shooters to a preposterous degree, right? What if we just posted stories about them, uh, you know, just nonsense, but made them look horrible? Just posted stories about, you know, rumors floating around about they were, you know, caught fucking a puppy or something horrific, or maybe they went crazy because they were furious about having a micro penis so small they, they literally did have to use a pair of tweezers to jerk off. Now, I'm being ridiculous there. I'm being ridiculous there. But, 
I'm just saying, like, what if we just painted them in the most pathetic, negative light possible so that nobody else would want to get the attention that they're currently receiving? Uh, mental illness is a likely factor in many of these shootings. A survey by Mother Jones found that at least 38 of 61 mass shooters in the past three decades displayed signs of mental health problems prior to the killings. But if that's the case, why aren't more countries experiencing the same thing with their mentally ill citizens? The sad truth is we don't fucking know why this is happening. Uh, now, this is just pure speculation, but I think the recent rise in public shootings has something to do with the new fame is more important than why you've become famous culture we live in. This started in the late 90s and early 2000s with the rise of reality TV, social media, and the web. Suddenly, people are becoming web celebrities and reality stars, and, and sometimes just for being spectacular assholes. People like Paris Hilton, going back further, Puck from the real world. You used to have talent. You used to have to have talent in a particular arena to become famous. You had to be a good actor. Uh, musician, comic, host, something, anything. You had to have a, a discernible form of talent. And then suddenly you could become famous for just being a piece of shit. And then thanks to the internet, entire chat rooms could devote themselves to talking about how cool pieces of shit were, like the Columbine shooters. There was also suddenly 24-hour news stations, and instead of needing to fill a few hours of programming a day with the news, they had to fill all day with the news. And so the names of criminals get mentioned over and over and over again. Suddenly, there's 20 news stations instead of three, all competing for your attention. Who can sell the tragedy the hardest, right? Who can sell the best ratings by talking about it the most? And these killers get talked about for months and months on end. I think that amount of media coverage combined with the desire for fame young people have that didn't exist before, because now you can be famous for just being a fucking idiot, for just being a piece of shit, drives crazy people to do things they maybe wouldn't have done otherwise. They know they're not talented enough to become famous for something, you know, valid, but they also know that killing a bunch of students will get their name out there on the web forever. Who knows? Maybe that only makes sense in my head. Something I've thought about a lot. I, I, I don't know what to do, but I want to hear what you think. Sometimes you don't need to have the answer. Sometimes it's just important to keep the conversation going, one that might lead to someone else coming up with the answer. So send me yours, you know, for this Friday's Time Sucker update. Send them going further. Uh, for right now, I got nothing else. Time for top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, we've been arguing about guns since the Second Amendment was ratified in 1791. It's only 27 words long. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, shall not be infringed. Number two, the United States has the most guns per capita out of any nation in the world. Two of its cities... New Orleans and Detroit are in the top 25 for the most violent crimes per capita of any city in the world. However, Switzerland has the second most guns per capita and the lowest crime rate in the world. What are we doing wrong? What's going on in our country outside of guns? Number three, will banning a few weapons really do anything to prevent more mass shootings? The worst school attack in U.S. history happened nearly 100 years ago. It used dynamite. The deadliest school sh shooting and U.S. Uh, history since was a Virginia Tech shooter killing 32 in 2007 with handguns. Number four, how many violent crimes do guns prevent? They don't just take lives. Would, would more education around guns and mental health keep our kids and citizens safe? There is so much more research that needs to be done, so let's do it. Number five, new info. What about smart guns? Have you heard of these? The future solution to gun control will likely lie in tech smarts, you know? Uh, in 1999, uh, a few years before the invention of the iPod, Jonathan Mossberg, family member and employee of the OF Mossberg & Sons, the nation's oldest family-owned gun company, began to build the iGun, a computer chip-equipped smart gun that could only be fired by its owner. But certain gun rights activists, uh, advocates weren't ready for it, saw it as some sort of kind of gateway, some sort of Trojan horse into taking away their guns. But it does work. Just like my iPhone X recognizes my face to unlock an iGun's trigger does recognize the owner, doesn't pull without the proper owner holding it. How much more sophisticated can weapons get? Can we eventually have invisible gun detection barriers around schools that send off alerts, lock schools down, and with protective barriers before, students can even re before shooters can even reach the front door? Can certain guns, such as semi-automatic weapons, come with owner recognition software so no one can take your gun and commit horrible crimes with it? Could they recognize where you are via GPS technology and not allow you to fire at all in certain public areas? At the rate of tech advancement, I think this will all be possible and a lot of today's issues will be solved. It's what we need to do in the meantime that we still got to figure out. Time suck. Top five takeaways.
The big gun debate has been sucked as well as I can suck it. Holy shit, that was intense. I uh, hope I at least sparked some new thoughts with all that. And just, uh, you know, just now, just know, excuse me, that whether you're a gun lover or, or a gun hater, you know, I, I get where you're coming from. Even if I don't agree with your stance, uh, odds are I feel like your heart's in the right place. And I hope you felt like uh, my heart was in the right place with this one. Hail Nimrod. Also, a bunch of free ringtones are now in the Time Sucks store. Free ringtones for both Android and iPhone users. The show intro and outro, uh, most of the segment intros are up. Uh, a- as is a fan made, just pass on my crack. Uh, remix ringtone. So put the suck on your phone. Put it in your brain. It's free. Uh, now come see me, you bastards. Get out there and grab some uh, tickets to my Flat Earth tour. All over the South, it's early April. Some of those shows looking like they're going to sell out before the night of the show, which is amazing. So get your tickets now. Don't wait for the door. Those shows up at dancummins.tv. Ticket links for upcoming dates in today's show description. Check out those dates. Snatch up some tickets. Thanks to Harmony Velikamp, Jesse Dobner, Lindsey Cummins, Josh Krell, the entire Time Suck team. Uh, thanks for all the reviews and spreading the suck. Post on social media. Reference it on Reddit. Spread that sweet suck. Every review helps so much. Uh, this Friday is a bonus episode, and there was no bonus episode vote. Here's why. There's just too many episodes and things happen right now for me to do bonus votes uh, going forward since two episodes are now decided each each month by Space Lizard votes. Over 2,000 Space Lizards now, by the way. Oh, my God. Hit that milestone. Thank you so much. Thanks for voting in uh, two, two cool topics every month. But in order to have proper prep time for all these extra episodes now, I can't have three last-minute topics every month and stay sane. So I'm picking the bonus episodes from the suggestions. And this Friday, Richard Ramirez, The Night Stalker, a serial killer who scares me like almost no other. He was a serial killer, rapist, burglar, highly publicized home invasion crime spree uh, where he terrorized the residents of the greater Los Angeles area and, and, a, and a little bit later, the residents of San Francisco from June of 84 to August of 85 Prior to capture, dubbed the Night Stalker by the news media, used a variety of weapons, including handguns, knives, machete, tire iron, hammer, talked about worshiping Satan. He was an evil, sadistic, maniacal piece of shit. And is it weird to say I'm excited to suck him? Yeah, I am. And now let's find out what you suckers have been up to with this week's Time Sucker Update. Updates. Get your Time Sucker Updates. All right, really fun update today sent in by uh, uh, so many suckers. Time suckers Corey Daniels, Rob Maggs, Noah Wooten, Ian Frazier, so many others let me know that Mad Mike Hughes has attempted his homemade rocket launch. It's happened now after a couple failed launches. He's he's launched himself uh, into the atmosphere to prove that the Earth is flat and he didn't die. The 61-year-old limo driver and self-taught rocket scientist made it all the way this past Saturday, all the way up to almost 1,900 feet above the Mojave Desert near Amboy, California. He almost made it high enough to learn some stuff. To make, it, to make it to the boundary of the Earth's atmosphere and outer space, the Kármán line as it's known, you only have to make it to 330,000 feet. So he was so close, so close. He only had another 328,100 uh, feet to go in his, in his homemade rocket to make it to the place where he could see for sure that the Earth is round before then quickly falling and crashing to his death. So... He still thinks the Earth is flat, but he is also alive. So that, so that part's good. Other than hurting his back a bit, getting some bumps and bruises, he feels good about the experience. Relieved, he said, after being checked out by paramedics. I'm tired of people saying I chickened out and didn't build a rocket. I'm tired of that stuff. I manned up and I did it. Ah, oh, you did man up, Mad Mike Hughes. You manned up. Now if you could just brain up a little bit, it'd probably be good. Uh, this, this, this is from Brandon Stover. Saying, thy dearest sucketh master, my brother's getting married next year, and I'm his best man for a best man's gift. He bought us tickets to see you in Cleveland, and it was absolutely awesome. We traveled from Pittsburgh on Friday afternoon. After the show, you and Lindsay sat at the bar with us for a couple of hours, and we just hung out and shot the shit. That meant a lot to us. You two are great people, and I just wanted to thank you. Keep on sucking. Brandon Stover and Dan Flynn. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you so much. It was great meeting you both and hanging out, especially with Lindsay there. She's coming more and more to the shows now. I, I just don't get to hang out often at shows. I know a lot of you guys uh, uh, offer to hang out, and I, I appreciate it every time. 99% of the time I can't because i got to rush off to get some sleep for either uh, media the next day or research or just because I'm fucking dog-ass tired. But that night it worked out, and I'm glad we had a great time, and thanks for making that drive. And finally, 
Uh, this in from uh, Jeff uh, Minibol, M- M- Minbiol, I believe. I uh, hope I'm hope I'm spelling that that right. Uh, you know these names. Now now I feel like I got to look it up again. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay, Jeff. All right. I think I got it. Now Jeff wrote in uh, saying, "You son of a bitch! I have put up with the McDonalding, and I enjoy the Bojangles bits, but this goddamn piney." or however the fuck you spell those inbred hill folks' names song, is the most obnoxious trash you have come up with. It was painful in its original episode, but I thought it would be like the Vlad songs and only appear in that episode. I was gravely mistaken. It has sunk its dirty, filthy claws into more episodes and immediately puts me to a seven on the old pissed-off scale. For the love of Nimrod, praise be unto him, stop it. Though I will not stop listing, my resentment is not that strong. Please sprinkle it in like one out of every hundred bonus episodes only. Please. Well, Jeff, I appreciate the uh, the input, and I think you know what my answer is. Well, looky here now. I got some pick. Taste this pick. I ever did lick out of my woman's beard. Well, looky here now. With a full belly, I made a butt baby with the woman on mine. And the governor's what we got. woo Gotcha. I got you. You just been pinied. And thanks to all of you for today's Time Sucker updates. Thanks, Time Suckers. I needed that. We all did. Have a fantastic week, suckers. Be responsible when it comes to gun ownership and when it comes to gun control knowledge. Be nice to each other. Keep on talking about everything. And damn it, keep on sucking. <laughs>